Thank you for being here this evening, for joining us uh, for uh, a lecture by Hetty Juda on quite an important topic that we don't uh, often discuss uh, in this institution. So I'm very happy that you came in large numbers to join us for that. Um, I will shortly introduce Hetty and say a few words on the publication that we will be discussing this evening, and then um, we can make a start. So Hetty Juda is an art critic, broadcaster who has worked for many years on the topic of art and motherhood. Following the publication of her study on the impact of motherhood on artists' careers, in 2020 she went on to work with a group of artists to draw up the manifesto How Not to Include Artist Parents, and that you can still consult online on the artistparents.com website. In 2022, together with Joe Harrison, she co-founded the Art Working Parents Alliance, a support network and campaigning group for curators, academics, galleries, technicians, educators, and others working in the arts. She's also an author, uh, and this evening we will discuss her recent publication, How Not to Exclude Artist Mothers and Other Parents. That is also the result, in a way, of this long-term uh, commitment and research. Um, I find that many contemporary or more contemporary artworks today address the topic of motherhood. Uh, they range from the raw, the honest depictions of Tala Madani to other ways of engaging with the subject uh, in the work of Camille Enrou and uh, Guylaine Lyon, for example. Um, however, once the duties, the physical, the mental endurance that comes with parenthood enters day-to-day -day operations in the art world, they are often met with misunderstandings, neglect, or I wrote simple awkwardness. <laughs> That's what I've uh, sometimes experienced. Um, and the publication uh, confirms it partly, but luckily it also provides many examples of alternative models to better accommodate the needs of young uh, artist mothers, artist parents, um, and people with, how you call it very beautifully, caring responsibilities. Um, and what I also found very important is that it foregrounds this understanding that most of the problems that we will discuss this evening are of a structural nature instead of a personal one, because young parents uh, often hear that we, okay, now I'm giving my biographical <laughs> information, that wasn't the point, but um, that they've chosen for the situation and so they also carry the responsibility for it. Um, so, I have a quote by Adriana Rich. I think I will skip all of this. Uh, we have limited time. So, Hetty, welcome. Thank you for joining us again. And um, I give you now the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, yes, and I should say it's not just young parents as well. I think we see these all from different situations and I'm very much not a young parent, um, I'm an old parent, uh, and, but it, these structural issues still have um, quite a big impact I think, you know, many, many years on kind of into the future. There's a kind of like a weird buzzy sound, is that, is the audio okay? Yeah, it's yeah, right, okay, good, good. Um, so this evening I'm, rather than giving a lecture from the book, I'm really going to talk a bit about the background to the book. I'm going to address some of the subjects that come up in the book. Um, and I was invited by Tanya particularly to talk about um, issues with art schools and art education, because this is a very university and college rich town. And then I'll finish up just talking really briefly actually about older parents, because this was one of the questions that I couldn't resolve particularly in the book is how as, um, a parent who's taken time out to look after a family, you get back into the art world. It's a very difficult issue to tackle, but also one that's very, very pertinent to the current exhibition at SMAC, which is the Rose Wiley Show. Um, so this whole enterprise really started a few years ago when there was a kind of blossoming of um, studies in the art world in various different countries looking at the representation of gender. Um, so in the United States, there have been fantastic studies by Charlotte Burns and Julia Halperin called the Burns Halperin Report. They've got a new one that's just come out just now. Uh, in Australia, there's been the Countess Reports. I imagine there have been similar reports in the Dutch-speaking and French-speaking worlds. Um, 
in the United Kingdom, there have been a series of reports sponsored by the Freelands Foundation. Um, and so over the course of about seven years, they've looked at the representation of gender all over the art world. It can be the representation of gender in museum collections, it can be temporary exhibitions, um, uh, it can be the representation of gender in institutions. So whether the director of an institution is male or female or non-binary. Um, and there were two sets of statistics from the report that came out, I guess, about four years ago that really struck me. And they seemed to me to really illustrate something going very, very wrong. And I was interested about in as to what was happening between these two different graphs. The first is this one. So this is a graph showing the applicants for postgraduate study in creative arts and design. So they have, she, she studied the figures for intakes for secondary school art studies for um, undergraduate. But by this point, this is MAs and PhDs. So this is people who are really serious about a career in the art world. And what she found was that about 66% uh, of the people on these courses were female or non-binary. So it's majority female or non-binary at this point. So let's say um, these are probably people that are in their late 20s, early 30s, possibly. Um, and the next graph is of um, the, the gender balance between artists represented by commercial galleries. And what we see here is a complete reversal of that figure. And I'm just looking at the living or the, you know, the, the, all the artists as opposed to the deceased artists, obviously. Um, so I think 68% of the artists represented by commercial galleries are male and the remainder are female and non-binary. So there's a complete inversion of those figures. And I'm really interested as to why that is. Now we can kind of jump up and down and kind of go, it's structural sexism. But it also occurred to me that there's a big shift that happens in an artist's life quite often between the point where they leave art college and around the time when they get um, professional representation. So that would be, let's say, in their mid-30s or 40s. And quite often what happens in people's lives is they start a family. And I was really curious as to whether this had any kind of impact on whether an artist was more or less likely to get commercial representation. Um, so early in uh, 2020, I put out an open call on Instagram um, and got an enormous number of responses. Basically, I was inviting artists to talk to me about whether motherhood had had an impact on their career. And it was just when the pandemic hit. And so I had a lot of spare time and was stuck at home, as were a lot of other people. And so I got about, well, it was about 60 artists who contacted me. And I ended up interviewing just over 50 of them um, and conducting quite long range interviews. And the, the, the message that was coming back was overwhelmingly that as these artists, as soon as they started a family. In fact, as soon as they became pregnant, they noticed an entire shift in the way that the art world was behaving towards them. Um, and then, you know, we went on to discuss all kinds of structural issues, but it was really dramatic that there was right from that, that initial point, a kind of, a, the exclusion started really from the time of pregnancy. Um, so I just wanted to go through a couple of, you know, the artists who responded to the, um, to my open call. So this is Rezia Wahid, who's a fantastic textile artist. Um, this is actually a synesthetic response to her four pregnancies that's called Dancing in the Womb. So during each pregnancy, she felt attracted to different smells. She had a sense of a different color. So, and it led the different rhythms of the different pregnancies she's, she's experienced. Uh, and she, I mean, she's pretty well established in London and had been at that point and was getting a lot of public commissions and was doing quite a lot of education work, um, working with institutions. And she said, once people found out that I was pregnant, the distancing, the, the distancing started happening. There were no conversations, just a lack of communications and offers. I was seen as not creating work or not being able to create work. When I told people I was creating and that I could participate in exhibitions, I was either seen as lying or telling half truths. Now this pattern really repeated itself through quite a lot of the interviews, that basically the institution cut off communication with the artist as soon as they discovered that she was pregnant. Um, they didn't have a conversation, they just assumed that the artist would no longer be available, or that perhaps they were no longer suited to commissions. 
This is Echo Morgan, who's a performance artist, and she had a very particular issue because she uses her body a lot in the in performance work. So she worked with um, a lot of paint, uh, like body paint, and she had Chinese characters painted over her. And before she had children, she had a very androgynous, childlike body, which really changed after she gave birth. And she says that it really changed her relationship as as a physical performer with her body giving birth. Um, but again, she suffered from this kind of exclusion as soon as she became pregnant. When I first found out I was pregnant, two of my international performances got cancelled. Both curators were actually female, but without children. They both emailed me and said, good luck with the family life. If you ever decide to perform again in the future, please keep me informed. And I think what's also really interesting here is that these were female curators and that quite often, actually women aren't brilliant allies to other women who become parents. Uh, and some of the, the worst behavior and the worst treatment that I've, I've heard about in the studies has been by other women, sometimes even older women with children, but they've been extremely um, judgmental and dismissive, uh, and they've ended up repeating, essentially replicating bad patterns that they experience themselves. Uh, this is Emma Franks, um, who's a painter, but she also makes these fabulous costumes. And I'm afraid tonight I'm actually missing her performance with her menopausal punk band called Hot Flush. Um, but she made this really beautiful observation, which I think kind of encapsulates things really well. I don't think society takes artists or mothers seriously. So being an artist and a mother is a double whammy. Um, which I think really encapsulates things quite well. I mean, you think about the way that mothers are kind of like, the, they're the butt of jokes. If you go and see any comedian, the comedian will be talk, telling jokes about their mother and, you know, the mother will be this ridiculous figure that's, you know, full of comic over-concern. So to be a female artist and a mother, you, you've got that intersection happening quite badly. Um, this is Rosalind Farham. Um, and she's, she's, like many of the artists I've spoken to, she's been through quite difficult experiences. But I think in a way that really illustrates the fact that you know, artist mothers or you know, non-binary parents are in a way experiencing all of the same difficulties and injustices that any other parent might experience. They can be in abusive relationships, they can have mental health issues, they can have children that need extra care, they can have relationship breakdowns, they can be in controlling relationships. You know, so there's all of that going on on top of the, the work that's going on as a mother. And she said something that I think was so sad, but is replicated again and again in people that I've spoken to. I recall someone asking me what I did. And I said, I'm an artist. And they said, how can you be an artist when you don't make anything and you don't sell the things you don't make? And this is a real crisis that lots of um, artist parents experience when they're, let's say, 10 years into raising a family and they've not had any time to focus on their own practice. Can they still call themselves an artist if they're not making work, they're not selling work, they're not showing work? And it becomes a real crisis of identity at that point. Uh, I think it's, a, it's a, an experience that's really common to a lot of artists. Um, so there are obviously all kinds of factors that play into this. One of the most important factors is the gender pay gap. So whenever you experience a gender pay gap, you're going to have a gendered care gap because if you have a, a relationship, a heterosexual relationship, um, the person who is earning more, it makes sense if they continue to work and the person who's earning less stays in the home and looks after the children. So in heterosexual relationships, the gendered pay gap has an enormous impact. Um, so in the UK, it's pretty bad, um, it's between five and 10%. Does anybody know what it is in Belgium, out of interest? It's actually much better here. You're really um, pretty good, you're 5.3 which is, I think, one of the lowest gender pay gaps in Europe. It does get worse for older women. So when it goes up to older women, it's about 8.9% if you're in your 50s. Um, so that has an immediate impact on um, artists who are you know, deciding who gets to be the caregiver within a, within a relationship. Um, what was really interesting was that among artist couples, quite often the artists decided to do 50-50 care. And... Interestingly, those were some of the most equally balanced relationships, and it, it ended up with um, the artist's mother being able to continue her career in a way that didn't happen if, for example, the partner was working in banking or was working in medicine or was working in you know, a kind of salaried office employment. So having had all of these results coming through from the women that I interviewed and the non-binary people I interviewed, 
Um, I was obviously very upset about the situation as it stood and felt that I really needed to do something to change the way that the art world was behaving towards artist mothers and artist parents. So the first thing that I did was um, gathered together a group of about 30 artists and we worked together on a manifesto uh, called How Not to Exclude Artist Parents. Uh, this is now available in 15 different languages. We have one of the Dutch translators in our midst here. Thank you very much, Karen. And also the Portuguese, well, the Brazilian Portuguese translator here, Lima. So, and it's also audio described um, and you can, it's open access. You, anybody can take it and they can copy it. They can use it in any way they want. And it's been very interesting seeing the way that in the United Kingdom, lots of artists have used points from the manifesto in grant funding applications to support the fact that their work on the subject of motherhood is legitimate or the fact that they took a career break to become a mother was, was um, you know, didn't invalidate their work as an artist. Um, but this introductory comment by Melanie Jackson, which we, we launched it with, I think is really outlines why this is such an important subject. Supporting diversity, whether it be age, ethnicity, gender, loan or parental status, isn't just about being fair. It's also about allowing a diverse flow of experience, nuance, innovation and invention to flourish. So the work, the gallery, the practice of art is as rich as it can be. Dispensation for real life needs to start to be built into all collaborations with artists. And this question of whether we're doing this because it's fair and right, whether it's important for other reasons, I think really goes to the heart of this. And in fact, um, you mentioned Tala Madani in your introduction, and it was really interesting interviewing her for the book when she said, you know, um, she's a woman of an Iranian background. She's a woman, she's a mother. She says, I don't want to be in anyone's collection just because they think that it's right to be collecting artists from the Middle East or it's right to be collecting art by women. I want to be in these collections because my work's interesting and special. But the point is that if you're already excluding those works, then the art world's really missing out on a diversity of experience from a different life experience. You know, there's all kinds of emotions and life experiences that won't be present in the art world if art by parents isn't seen as valued or art on the subject of parenting isn't seen as valuable. We also started off with an introductory statement. Um, and I think we were feeling this very strongly because in the pandemic, certainly in the UK, the burden of care fell overwhelmingly to women in the, in the home. Responsibility for childcare currently falls overwhelmingly on mothers. We are using the word parent in these guidelines in the hope that this may change. This is a very, very political subject around a lot of the mothers that I spoke to. There are lots of people that want this to be an ungendered issue because as soon as you start to talk about parents rather than mothers, it becomes a societal issue rather than a women's issue. On the other hand, there are those that feel very strongly that if we just refer to parents, it erases centuries of unpaid women's labor and the fact that Domestic labor is assumed to be, you know, not unsalaried, un unvalued. Um, an introductory suggestion, treat the artist as a whole person. An introductory request, be flexible. This flexibility really is almost like the key request that we make to all institutions and galleries that we work with is, you know, don't expect the artist always to be hyper present, hyper available 24 hours a day. Be prepared to be flexible, have conversations with them, treat them like a human being. Um, as an organization, be explicitly welcoming to artists with families. Be breastfeeding friendly. Stay in contact with artists when they become parents. Stay in contact with artists when they become parents. It's very important. Uh, you know, artists spend so much time building up relationships with curators and with funding bodies and commissioning bodies. Don't suddenly cut off from an artist just because they've developed caring responsibilities. The art does not need to be family friendly, but the institution should be. Um, this question of the institution being family friendly, I have a particular anecdote about this, which relates to the institution we're currently in, which is 15 years ago when I came to the SMAC with my two sons, who at that point were five and seven years old. Um, I didn't know what was on at the SMAC at that point. So we came up to the desk and it was a show by Kendall Gears. And I said, is it suitable to take my children to the exhibition? And the person on the desk said, sure. And I took the boys into the, this show. And the opening room of it was um, a cross lined with a neon orange body bag. So I was like, they're not gonna know what those are, that's fine. And we walked into the next room and it was a room wallpapered with the word fuck repeated all over it. And my kids were just learning to read. So they were standing there going, fuck, fuck. And so I was like, quite into the next one. And the next one was a room wallpapered with pornography. Uh, and then we went upstairs and in the great big open plan upstairs spaces they had, um, uh, 
They had sculptures that were made. So they were to do with, you know, toxic environments, but one was made from razor wire and it was just based on the floor and another one was concrete stuffed with um, broken glass and they were just on the floor. Um, I'm not saying, if, and yeah, that's a fantastic and really important exhibition. It absolutely should be in smack, but there also should be content warnings in place so that people visiting with small children possibly might choose not to see that exhibition. Um, so this is what, when we talk about things being, the, the art doesn't need to be family friendly, but the institution should be. Things like content warnings or some consideration about the fact that people visiting an art institution aren't just um, students or they aren't just, you know, single people. You know, this needs to be built into somewhat into the structure of the institution. Um, make it standard practice to establish an artist's family circumstances at the outset of a project and have structures in place to accommodate their parenting responsibilities. It shouldn't be left to the artist to have to confess to being a parent or to fear they may lose a show, commission or residency if they do so. It was really striking how many artists felt that they needed to kind of come out about having children. And this was even in theoretically kind of feminist structures. So for example, the Max Mara Art Prize, um, I interviewed Emma Hart, who was one of the recent um, winners. So it's the Max Mara Art Prize for women artists, and it specifically is mid-career women artists, or let's say late emerging. Um, and she felt really awkward about the fact that she was having to say, I've got a two-year-old daughter who is absolutely going to have to come with me on the residency, the six-month residency. And they were kind of really shocked and not quite ready to accommodate that. So I think as an institution, not like don't assume that an artist isn't going to come with, without baggage and attachments. Um, I think one thing that's also really interesting is that there's this idea that if you talk about having a family, it's regarded as being unprofessional. And it's been very interesting. I've worked with quite a few um, neurodivergent artists recently, and I've noticed that whenever they start a project, they send you an access statement telling you what they need to do a project with you. And that's just a standard part of professional practice. And they say, these are my needs. This is how you, you deal with me. This is, the, these, this is like my, my terms of engagement in working with you. And I think that we can really flip this idea and to say, actually, if you're starting a project with someone and you lay out your you know, your terms and conditions, that's actually really good professional practice. That's being professional. Hiding things and putting them into the background, that's actually less professional. So saying, actually, I, I can't take phone calls after five o'clock and at weekends. Um, I need to have everything that I'm doing, um, you know, agreed in advance, or I need a certain amount of time given, let's say I need like four days given to reply to an email. It's not unreasonable, but it's just like laying out your terms and conditions so that you can work in a way that everybody understands the kind of parameters around the behavior. Um, this is for a residency more, but assume that any artist parent may need to travel with their child or children and a partner or caregiver and provide for this. Actually, this goes for institutions as well. If you're installing a show and somebody's got small children, they probably will need to travel with a nanny or a partner. Um, agree with the artist at the outset what's expected of them and when, and give enough lead times that they can plan accordingly. Don't make urgent last minute requests for texts, talks, and other extras. That sounds like obvious good behavior to me, but it's so not the way the art world behaves. Like you're constantly getting like, oh, actually, could you come and do a talk tomorrow? Or can you send us a text for this? Or can you do this interview? So that just like giving people notice is so important. And particularly if somebody's working within quite a structure, a tight structure of looking after children, they're not going to be able to respond within two hours to send a text or to reply to an email or do something. So give people kind of notice to do stuff. Um, this is kind of wishful thinking, but, allow, but budgeting to allow for childcare costs, which would be very nice. In the UK, you can't currently um, apply for an Arts Council budget and, and include childcare as a budget line, which seems ridiculous because it actually should be a work cost. Um, this is to do with scheduling. Schedule openings and special events as convenient to artist parents. Consider options such as weekend brunch private views rather than sticking rigidly to early evenings when children need to be fed, bathed and put to bed. I've now spent a few years trying to organize artist parent friendly timed um, events. And I have to say that there is no kind of magic time that's right for everyone. <laughs> and whatever time you schedule something, somebody's gonna be really angry with you. But I think that What's important is to have a variety of different things. I actually, as a provocation to Tiny, said, how about doing a daytime event? But um, so, I mean, having things at 11 in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon or five o'clock in the afternoon or eight at night, 
just don't schedule all your important and exciting stuff at half past seven in the evening or half six in the evening because if you've got children at home, that's going to be when you're dealing with everything. It's like the most difficult time to, 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 um, to attend events. Be aware of term dates and program around them. Offer artists who need to travel with children the option of installing a show over half term or during school holidays. Rethink or remove age limits for residencies and awards. This is a huge issue because it's actually incredibly discriminatory against um, anyone who's got caregiving responsibilities. If you've got a 40 year old age, a 40 year age limit or even 50 on a, an award or residency, because if somebody's taken, let's say, 15 years out of their, oh, hello, I'm not moving fast. Is that me? Was it? Is everything okay? Yeah. Um, I don't think it is. I'm not sure it's anything I'm doing actually. I think it just. Let's see if that's. Um, yeah, it's but it, it really it cuts a lot of people out of being able to, um, you know, to apply for residencies or awards. Uh, particularly, doesn't allow them time to get back into their stride after taking time out to have children. Um, I'm going to be talking about this a lot in Switzerland, but it's to do with adapting residencies to work around the needs of artist parents. And this is a really important point, which is don't read gaps on a CV to indicate a lack of commitment or effort. And it's really interesting in the corporate world that this is really shifting. So there was a change on um, LinkedIn two years ago where they put a new button on LinkedIn where if you had a, a gap on your CV, you could say this is because of uh, time to uh, time out to spend with family. This is because of health. And they found that actually employers would much rather know why there was a gap on your CV. And once they knew, they didn't worry them so much. It's just when there's not an explanation. Um, so I think the, I'm hoping the culture is changing, but I think for artists, definitely there's this terror that if they lose momentum, that they're never going to get the chance again to come back into the art world. So after that, the next thing I did was write this book. Uh, there are 15 copies of it, only 15 copies of it available um, in the bookshop. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of the things that I discuss in the book. Uh, and, and for the book, I didn't just lay out the kind of terrible stuff. I did also talk to people who were doing things differently. Um, so I had some thoughts about art schools. And one of them really comes from this artist. And it's just, I think, also a sign of how toxic things are in academia. This is one of the artists that wanted to be anonymous in the, in the book. So she says, when I was an undergraduate student in the 1990s, the mature female students in their 30s and 40s were called knitters by the male lecturers because they weren't making real art. They also described the full-time female lecturers as part-timers because they left work on time to go home to their families. A former colleague of mine as recently as 2014 pointed to a book on my office bookshelf about mother artists and said he always made a point to tell each year group that the girls shouldn't have children because their careers would be over and they'd have nothing to say anymore. I mean, I, this is just an extraordinary statement, but it goes into so many things where, for example, work made by women in their 30s and 40s wasn't seen as being proper art. Work that's, for example, dealing with textiles or craft um, traditions wasn't seen as proper art. Uh, the idea that if you go home on time, you're seen as part-time. So there's this expectation in the art world that people will be providing free labor all the time. They'll be working constantly over time. And the instruction that uh, girls shouldn't have children because their careers would be over, but also they'd have nothing to say anymore, which suggests that art that's concerned with anything to do with family is seen as nothing to say. It's not seen as a legitimate subject for making art. This is somebody that's teaching currently in, a, in a, an art school in Britain. Um, what is the art world's problem with mothers? It starts with a mother-shaped hole in art history. Um, this is a quote from Susan, Susan Freeman, who also came up with that fantastic phrase about sodomistical mothers in, that Maggie Nelson uses in Argonauts. I'm sure lots of you have read Argonauts. Susan Freeman wrote a book called um, Cool Men and the Second Sex, which is really looking at how you define cool. And she's looking at this idea that Basically, if you're like just right in the introduction, she talks about this idea of the male rebel and the archetypal male rebel. Who does the archetypal male rebel rebel against? It's his mother. So that's what that's where the mother is shoved. She's shoved as the definition of not cool. Um, certainly, when I was at college, there was a complete invisibility of not only female artists, but also the figure of the mother in art history. So this is obviously Artemisia Gentileschi. This was painted in, I think, 1613. Uh, which was the year that she had the first of her five children. Um, 
four of her children died. Now we tend to think of Artemisia as a woman that's caught up in this whole narrative around revenge. This aspect of Artemisia isn't really talked about very much still. Um, the fact that, I, th I mean, I, I'm sure Eliza knows an earlier painting, but this is the earliest painting I can think of by a mother of the Madonna. Um, and she is there very much engaging with her child. She is not unlike Rubens' women flashing her boobs all over the place for everybody to enjoy. Um, so I think this is a really extraordinary painting. It's a slightly yellow copy, sorry. Um, but I'm really interested that there is very much an invisibility of artist mothers. So this is Mary Beale painting in 1666. She was a very successful artist at the time in London. She did specialise in painting family pictures. And so here this is acting very much as an advertisement for her work. And that's to a painting of her two sons that she's holding. So she's presenting herself both as a mother and as an artist. And this is considered to be an advert for what she's doing. Um, this, of course, is Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. Um, this was a very scandalous painting. Does anybody know why? Uh, it's actually she's smiling and showing her teeth. So this was painted in the 1780s, and at the time the French nobility had really disgusting rotten teeth, I guess because they were eating a lot of sugary stuff. And so it was seen as being not very respectable to show your teeth in a painting. So she, he is, she's here not only with a child, but showing her lovely white teeth. Um, but she, again, this was very much painted as an advertisement for what she could do. So she was painting the women of the royal court and their families. And so she, here she is looking beautiful, wearing an absolutely gorgeous outfit with her daughter looking very wonderful as well. So this was, an, this was very much her advertising herself. But these works were very much not canonical. They're not part of what I was taught when I was at university. Uh, and there is this real issue that if the domestic realm and the mothers and children within it were the domain of women artists like Mary Beale, like Vigée Lebrun, and women artists were inferior in the ideas of the art historians, then by logical extension, those were not great subjects for art. And this is the hangover that comes down to us today, this idea that the domestic realm and motherhood are not the realms of great art. And we still have the hangover with that, unbelievably, all these years later. There is also a genuine hazard in motherhood. Um, part of it is to do with actually simply getting married in that you lose your name as an artist. Um, so this is an artist who was born Edna War. Um, when she got married, she became Edna Clark Hall. So you get one body of work with one name and one with another. She was part of an exceptionally talented intake year of women in the British art school called the Slade uh, in the 1890s. She, I mean, she, she was a total star. I think she started at the age of 13 or 14 and she, was, she won all of the prizes in her year. Um, and it's really interesting that there were four very talented women in that intake and they got all the prizes um, over, over the male artists in their year. Um, and of the four artists, so they were um, Edna Waugh, Gwen Salmon, Ida Nettleship. The only one that's really widely remembered is this one, which is Gwen John, who was the only one who didn't get married and didn't have children. Um, and she very much stated she wanted a life free from convention and family ties. And it's very interesting that she comes down to us and her work comes down to us. But it was also incredibly dangerous, like physically dangerous. So this is Ida Nettleship, painted heavily pregnant by Gwen John's brother, Augustus John. Um, she died at the age of 30, having given birth to five children in six years. Um, so, you know, in the years before contraception and legal abortion, becoming a mother, carried that hazard at that point. And she felt completely lost by the experience of being a mother. She was an incredibly talented artist. Pretty much nothing that she did remains in public view. And as soon as she started having babies, she just kept having babies. And she said, I may only be, it may only be because there's nothing else to do now that painting is not practicable and I must create something. So it's interesting that she, even then in this letter to a friend, she regarded um, having a child as a creative act. I mean, even down to more recent times, motherhood was very hard to reconcile with bohemian life. And I think there's this real problem when we look at the 20th century avant-garde that, you know, motherhood's a really tricky subject. And you know, I say this in the book, it's a line from the book, a visionary experimental life of the mind was considered at odds with bourgeois considerations such as gainful employment and family duties. So this is Jacqueline Lombard. Um, she was a performer initially. So she used to perform in a tank of water in, in, in Paris in um, the 1930s. She became the partner of André Breton, the father of surrealism. Um, 
And she was also an artist. Uh, and she says at a certain point, he saw in me what he wanted to see, but he didn't really see me. They had a child together and she was looking after the child and she was no longer regarded as an artist. And Andre Breton was going around the world preaching the gospel of surrealism. And she was just this kind of like nymph-like creature that accompanied him and he didn't take her at all seriously. She had an amazing life. She was a great friend of Frida Kahlo's. I think probably also a lover of Frida Kahlo's. Um, and she did actually show work during her life. Um, I've managed to track down a few works by her. This is made in the 1940s. It's obviously very influenced by Wilfredo Lamb. I think she'd probably been to Cuba with Breton around then. Uh, and she kept making work. She was working, making work right through to the 1960s. But we don't remember Jacqueline, Lam Jacqueline Lambert. We possibly remember her as this very beautiful character that turns up in other people's photographs. One woman that was allowed to be in the Surrealists was Eileen Agar. And again, she made a, an absolute decision that she wanted something more worthwhile than the usual repetitive routine of marrying and having a brood of children. So she was, she was I think, the only woman that showed in the um, International Surrealist Exhibition in London. Um, and again, with the feminist avant-garde, if we're looking at the 60s, 70s, and 80s, this is the book that I kind of, you know, learned about feminist art from. This was published in 2001. There's almost, I think there's pretty much no motherhood in there, almost nothing at all apart from Mary Kelly. It kind of, it gets written out of the feminist canon. It's really interesting. Um, so we just had a fantastic exhibition in London by, of work by Carolee Schneeman. Um, she, when she was a young woman, I guess around this stage in her life, she went down to Cuba and had an, an abortion when it was still illegal in the United States. Um, she writes about it to a friend. She had it without anesthetic. Um, and she just remembers feeling the pain as bursts of freedom going through her body. And it was, I mean, it was horrific, but also just this great sense of being relieved from the, the being condemned to be a mother as she essentially saw it. Um, this is from a text that I'm actually discussing tomorrow in, in, at Page Not Found in The Hague. Um, it's a text called Anti Demeter. And she recalls the experience of being pregnant. And she says, you're not invited into my body. I did not invite an alien being, a child, into my future. I had a mountain to climb. Pregnancy was constant pissing and terror, not nausea, but terror. I was taken over. I was no longer an I. So this is this really, really strong statement by one of the most avant-garde feminist artists of her experiencing a loss of a sense of self, loss of identity on becoming pregnant. Um, and also this feeling that she had a mountain to climb. She couldn't do it with a child. She was carrying enough as a woman trying to make it in a man's world at that point. And I'd say that pretty much the kind of that that the, the one canonical work in the feminist avant-garde that has come down to us concerned with motherhood is, of course, Mary Kelly's postpartum document. But what's really interesting is that she speaks the language of minimalism in this work. So it's all to do with engaging with, I mean, she engages with a lot of um, psychoanalytic theory, but she also looks at motherhood as something that's repetitive. So it has that repetitive sequential nature that lots of the kind of the, the work by men, the minimalist works by men were doing at that time. This also caused a scandal when it was shown in London because this is a used nappy liner. The color, it's got a slightly brownier color that you can't really see on that screen. Um, so there were, she, this was a work that went over six years and she really took her child right through from its first bowel movements up to its early mark making and engagement with language and was really looking at parenthood as being this very repetitive I mean, anybody that's a parent will know it. It's, you know, like you're going back to the same thing day after day after day after day after day and engaging with that as a kind of rhythm in art making. Um, so this is the final section of it, which is really looking at kind of him, her child starting to write. And this is what it looks like exhibited. It's, it's very minimal. Um, this is an earlier work, actually, which I think is incredibly interesting and I'm going to try and revive somehow in an exhibition I'm putting on next year. So this is um, Mila Ladman Ukalis, and she um, put together this amazing exhibition proposal, which I'm not going to show in its entirety, but it's called uh, a man a ma The Maintenance Art Manifesto in 1969. And she essentially proposed that she came to a gallery and she carried out the duties that she had at home in the space of the gallery. 
But in it, she makes this, I think, really wonderful distinction between two things, uh, two forms of making. One is um, development, which she calls pure individual creation, the new change, progress, advance, excitement, flight, or fleeing. So development is what we might think of as art in the classic understanding of it. And she distinguishes that from maintenance, which is keeping the dust off the pure individual creation, preserve the new, sustain the change, protect progress, defend and prolong the advance, renew the excitement, repeat the flight. So these are in quotes like feminine, feminine activities. Um, and I love the, the, the kind of statement she has, the sabol of every revolution. After the revolution, who's going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? Um, and as she says, maintenance is a drag. It takes all the fucking time. And there are lots of fantastic works that have been completely erased from feminist art histories. This is part of a film by Catherine Elwes called There is a Myth, which is her baby hitting her breast and she starts lactating. And it was actually commissioned for Channel 4 television in the UK and they and refused to show it because it had scandalously a nipple on it that was lactating rather than therefore enjoyment. Um, the problem with art schools is also structural, it's not just curricular. And I go into this quite a lot in the book, but um, there's very much this expectation these days that um, artists won't simply do a BA, they'll go on to do an MA. Quite often artists take a pause between the two. So they'll go on to take an MA, let's say in their late 20s or early 30s. And quite often this will coincide with people becoming pregnant. And art schools absolutely are not set up to deal with pregnant people. They're not set up to deal with lactating people. They're not set up to, do with to deal with people that you know might have to fit things in around breastfeeding. It's really interesting that if you look at the United Nations, they are very, like UNICEF has this very, very strong outline of exactly what all workplaces should have and should offer. That's what every university and art school should be offering its students. It's laid out in the UNICEF guide, guidelines, international guidelines for treating people you work with. Um, I, I mean, I, I know that in London, Goldsmiths has got a crash. I don't think it's got a lactation room. Um, but I think it's really interesting that as you know, the, this whole art school university world becomes more of a, um, a business model rather than just like a kind of public, publicly accessed structure. Uh, that you know that there are more and more people being brought into these universities, brought into art school at later and later stages in life, and they're just absolutely not anticipating that this kind of thing is going to be needed. So in fact, one of the people that I interviewed for the book is um, she's Dutch. She's based. She was at Saint. Am I correct? Saint Joost University. Is that correct? Saint Joost. Yeah, art school. And she wrote about her experience of going back onto the MA course, having um, given birth and needing to pump milk at the art school. And they actually, she said it was really exceptional. And she discovered it's one of the very few art schools in the Netherlands that did actually have a lactation room but it was really absolutely horrible and very unhygienic. It didn't get cleaned once. It didn't have Wi-Fi. It didn't have a window. So it was basically just like being in a cupboard. Um, and she really talks about feeling completely invisible and the fact that nobody else on faculty, nobody studying there was aware that there were mothers in the art school. So she's actually, she started something called the Vrouw Mantel Art Research Group where she she's um, talking a lot about the kind of structural issues that affect um, mothers in, in the Netherlands and here, I guess. Um, but so she was really seeing this invisibility of motherhood on the curriculum being completely echoed in the way that the art schools were treating their students. So there was this, you know, very much this idea that um, it was almost like an unspeakable thing, but also this hangover in art schools about what an artist was, who the idea that an artist might be was, you know, there was still this idea that an artist was like a kind of single, independently wealthy man, as opposed to the idea that an artist might also be a mother or might also be a parent, might be somebody with other caregiving responsibilities. Um, very briefly, because I know that I've gone slightly, well, kind of, you know, we're getting towards the end here. I just wanted to raise this question about um, returning to the art world after raising a family. Um, and I started, I kind of started to think about Rhodes Wiley, because I think this is Henrietta Oxlade's mouth. I'm not sure, but I think this is her daughter's mouth. But um, Rose Wiley obviously came back into the art world much later, but I was wondering whether my standard bits of advice about coming back into the art world are borne out by Rose Wiley. Um, so one of the things that I talk to people about is 
if they can afford it, not working from home, but going into a shared studio because people end up becoming very isolated and quite often depressed. I think if they're working from home, it's very tempting if your children have left home to use one of their bedrooms as a studio, but actually you end up becoming very isolated away from the discourse and not being around other artists making work. Um, I also talk quite often about how it can be really valuable to do a bit of re-education to go on an art course of some kind. And interestingly, Rose did go and she did a postgraduate course at the Royal College of Art in the late 1970s. So I guess when her children were in their teens, it would have been. A bit older, yeah. Yeah. So she really kind of restarted things. So she, both she and her husband, Roy, went back and studied a bit. Um, and I was looking at Roy Oxlade's writing about her, and I think this is really interesting because when he looks at her as an artist, you can tell that he's looking at her in that post-children moment because he talks about her total attention. She seems without effort, and this is crucial, to be able to give her total attention, freshly, without prejudice, to whatever it is that attracts her eye and be totally absorbed by its unique qualities. And I love the fact that he talked about attention because this is very much a phenomenon of making creative work as a parent is this, this quality of being constantly interrupted and not having full attention. So this is very much the kind of like uh, the evidence of somebody returning to the, to the art world as, um, as kind of once their children have got a little older. Um, but it's also to do with um, taking yourself seriously as well. It's, and I know that sounds like a really patronizing and weird thing to say, but quite often people seem to feel quite the need to apologize for their work when they've come back after a break and to feel that they're not worth spending money on and not worth um, in, that they don't feel like they 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 feel embarrassed about spending money on themselves or their work or investing in their work. And I think it's really important to do so. So in fact, one of the things that brought Rose Wiley back into the art world was that she won quite a significant award. And I think this thing of like putting yourself forward for awards, having a budget to put yourself forward for awards is important. Making sure you've got a studio, that you're in dialogue with people, that you're you know, engaging in the discourse. I mean, she had a very particular relationship with her husband, who was also an artist and a theorist. So I think they were talking about theoretical stuff all the time. So she definitely had that feeding her ideas about the art world. Just very quickly as we finish, I've just wanted to sound a quick word of warning because I think there's this perception that we're in a time of great progress in all of these things and that everything's getting better. So the first um, slides that I showed were from a study that was done three years ago. These are the same slides from the most recent version of that study, and they've got worse. So this is from last year. Uh, this is, uh, it's gone, I think it's changed by 1%. There are 1% more women on the art, uh, in the postgraduate art courses. And the representation of, um, uh, yeah, the representation. So that was, I think the first one was, God, I think I put it in twice, sorry. I'm just going to tell you, it's got, wor it's got, it's actually got worse representation of women by, um, by galleries. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm afraid I've ended, well, this computer's saying nine, my, my, my watch is saying three minutes too. I know that there's a gig going on, so if anybody needs to dash to the gig, please don't feel embarrassed to do it. However, I'm really happy to sit here having questions from people as long as people want to stay here. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me to. Um, would anybody like, to, if anybody would like to go, if everybody's desperate to get to the gig, please do go and then we will. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Karen? Okay. Thanks so much, Hetty. Um, I wondered if you also had reactions from the. Um, let's say, wider art world um, uh, working people. Um, because m myself, I'm still in a, I'm in a WhatsApp group with four uh, female curator friends. We didn't have the issue of motherhood as a team, but since, let's say, the pandemic, all of us have had uh, children and have had, uh, let's say, more difficult uh, career paths. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that curator in uh, at PS1 who was, you know, almost hired and fired yeah. uh, when they found out she was pregnant. I was wondering if you had more people talking to you, uh, not specifically artists, but uh, wider 
uh, people in the art world. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, I'm, I'm very glad you raised that actually, because I have, I have an excellent answer to it. Um, that in Sequel. fact, when I was, <laughs> when, um, when I was doing this research, I, I was contacted a lot, particularly by academics actually, who were saying they were being very badly treated um, in their workplaces. Uh, and also by people working for commercial galleries um, who were getting a lot of pressure to do an enormous amount of travel. I heard some complete horror stories, for example, people working uh, for PR companies that had miscarriages when they were working at art fairs and they weren't, they had to stay in their position at the art fair. So there was in general, like a massive institutional lack of understanding and lack of consideration. Um, so since the book launched together with Joe Harrison, I've uh, set up something called the Art Working Parents Alliance, which is specifically for curators um, and academics and people working in galleries, art fairs, technicians, educators. Uh, it's free to join. Currently, it's just in the UK. It is absolutely available to everybody to start a Belgian branch of the Art Working Parents Alliance. So we have, um, so let's say like monthly newsletters written by Joe and me, which we also do audio described. Um, and then we have WhatsApp groups, which are some of them are sector WhatsApp groups. So for academics or for people working in the public sector. Uh, and we also have regional WhatsApp groups so that if people are near to one another, they can meet up. And we're gathering data on, for example, the way that people have been treated around maternity leave, whether they face prejudice in the workplace, whether they're having problems and agreeing flexible or part-time contracts with universities. Um, and then in the summer, we're going to have a symposium at the Whitechapel Gallery in London with uh, lawyers, union representatives and uh, human resources professionals to put together a toolkit for negotiating, for example, maternity leave uh, and for and to really take, you know, and to hammer out best practice for arts organisations. And again, it's a question of, you know, that whole thing about coming out as a parent, that people quite often feel that they can't talk about being a parent in a professional context. I absolutely didn't myself. When I used to work at an art magazine, I'd never say, I need to go now because I need to pick my children up from school, you know, or I need to go now because I've got a parent-teacher meeting. So it's like, oh, I've got a meeting with my children. Um, <laughs> so it is, it is really important. And I think that this prejudice against caregiving responsibility, or people with caregiving responsibilities goes all the way through the art world. And it's a much less regulated world than many other industrial sectors. So it's really important to talk about it. But um, yeah, anybody that wants to set up uh, Art Working Parents Alliance in Belgium, please feel free to contact us. Um, do we have any other questions? <coughs> yeah, in the blue shirts. I was just wondering, is there a relationship with trade unions or is there like um, in your work or your experiences, do you have contact with, yeah, trade unions who, yeah. Uh, so it's like a, an interesting collaboration. This is this is still to come. So there is an artist union in Britain. It's not very active, but yeah, with this is something we're going to talk about. And I mean, I wonder whether it ends up in kind of trade union type activity. I don't know, but check it back five years time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have more questions? It's just it's all going along the front. <laughs> I'm. Um, I, I created myself a board game based on collecting testimonies of women working in the art world. And um, I found it difficult because the audience that come to play the, the, the game, I have the impression that it's always the same person that are interested in that subject is the people who are actually living it. Yeah. And I found it very difficult to, actually the game is not to point at a specific uh, individual. It's about the structure, it's about paradigm that I'm trying to invite people who are not <laughs> female artists who, are, who won't be mother to experience the the fact to to live their lives and uh, i can't i don't know how to have another type of public that is not already convinced that it's an important uh, subject or issue so i was wondering uh, with your fight as well because um, i studied in goldsmiths and in london i didn't really have a had a success with the game and i thought Oh, maybe most of the institution they think they're already over that topic. If, or I don't know, it just didn't happen. And it's mostly in Belgium, France, and Europe. Um, hearing you, I think I will try again with the game because I think it's still very important in UK. But it's about yeah, the audience. When even the title of your book, you address it to 
who and do you think that uh, um, the person who think it's not an important subject will somehow be impacted um, by your book and how you will reach that audience? Yeah, I mean, again, it's a really, really good question. And one of the things that comes up in the book um, is it's Martina Mullaney, who's an academic as well. And her actually her PhD is to do with this question of how you reach outside the artist mother echo chamber. Because so much of the stuff that happens in the UK happens within a bubble. And it becomes, you know, and, and it's great. There is a very healthy infrastructure around people talking and sharing experiences. But reaching out of that bubble is really important. I think what's quite interesting is that the, the series that my book appears in, it's called Hot Topics in Contemporary Art. It's co-produced by Sotheby's Auction House. And they put the topics as part of the curriculum on their courses for people studying for jobs in the art world. Um, and the other subjects in that um, collection of books are very much not to do with gender politics. So there's restitution, there's... Uh, the history of art fairs, there's the rise of private art museums in China, there's um, censorship. So in a way, it's presented not within a kind of gendered context at all, which I think is really nice. Um, I did, when I published it, I did want to have a strap line saying, if you don't think this book's for you, this book's for you. Because, you know, but then it's always, you know, it's really fantastic that Smack, for example, is supporting this. I haven't been invited to talk at Tate in London. It's definitely not over in the UK at all. Um, we have a really long way to keep going on this. And I think there's also this, this question of, you know, just thinking that it's a, a woman's issue rather than a societal issue. You know, it's, um, yes, keep going. It's definitely not over. Um, does anybody outside the front row want to uh, <laughs> ask a question? <laughs> Hello. Hey. Hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have an, uh, a question about um, what's the specific problem with the um, theme or the topic in the work of parents um, or in female um, parents, like concrete, because for me, I think everybody is daughter or a son or in a potential position to become a father or a mother. So uh, I was wondering what what is the concrete problem about those issues? Why, why are they not taken seriously? Um, I mean, I think this goes back to the slide I showed, which is saying that you know if the domestic realm is the the kind of um, topic that female artists engage with, and female artists are seen as being bad, hist art historically they're not seen as being interesting then almost by definition, that makes that subject like a not interesting subject art historically. I mean, that's the canonical view. I think there's still a real squeamishness around it. And it's really interesting how it's still very rare. There is also, I mean, it, obviously this is addressed in far greater length in the book. There is a particular phenomenon that quite often happens when people have children and they go through a kind of financial rebalancing, shall we say, or a life rebalancing where, for example, they can't justify paying for a studio outside of the home. So they start to make work in the home. And quite often that really changes the kind of art they can make. So they're not making large scale oil paintings. They're not making huge sculptures that require toxic materials. They'll, they'll maybe start making work on a domestic scale. And they'll maybe start working, make, start making work that engages with craft practices because actually they're very easy to pick up and put down if you're fitting your life around that whole interrupted thing of looking after children. That is a specific issue because great art is, you know, traditionally been large scale paintings and large scale sculptures. So again, there's a prejudice around medium and around dimensions of stuff as well, I think. Uh, that doesn't just affect work by women, it affects also, you know, art made outside um, the kind but of Euro-American kind of tradition as well. It sounds to me that it's more a problem about the identity of an artist, like how it's considered by the public. More I, than yeah, I, mean, I think this, thing, this question of the medium and the dimensions is also really important as well. You know, that the, particularly these big art galleries tend to kind of show like kind of big works that are, you know, made in more traditional media, as opposed to like small work, textile works, for example. Yeah, so a father um, depicting himself with daughter or with son, um, 
is okay. Um, I mean, there was, uh, so, I mean, that, it's interesting. I mean, I was kind of going around the art museum today. Uh, there was definitely like a domestic interior by a male artist that had all of his children. I don't think his wife was actually in the painting. Um, so it was him with all of his children. Um, and there were a few domestic interiors done by, but it's very much they, in that kind of Victorian world, it was very much the kind of angel in the house, the ideal mother with the perfect children. In the mid-century, there was definitely like a kind of realist tradition that was referred to as kitchen sink painting, which was people painting a kind of like very poor domestic interiors. And they were seen as being quite shocking at the time when they were painted. Um, I still think, I mean, it's kind of funny. You still see, for example, artist fathers carrying their children or being photographed with children and feeling like that's cool. And I think a lot of female and non-binary artists find that, find it, still find that they're very worried there's going to be prejudice against them for showing the fact that their parents, because they'll be seen as not serious. Um, so the artists that were a little older than me in the UK, like Rachel White Reed and Sarah Lucas and Tracy Ammon, very much being a parent wasn't on the cards for them. Um, in fact, Rachel White Reed was a parent, but she really kept it hidden. Like she doesn't talk about it. She's not pictured with her children. I hope that answers some way yeah, towards, yeah, yeah, I just think there's something wrong with the the idea of an artist more general. Like there's a fixed idea how an artist, like a female artist or by uh, whatever, that it has a certain uh, uh, list of things the artist should have or shouldn't have. And then if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Yeah. So I think it's more... Um, mentality problem than, than the subject problem or yeah I think it goes should, I mean, it's, it's all enmeshed together yeah, yeah we should change them, yeah. the mentality about it yeah do we have another question I think we're unless somebody's got a burning question I think we're all good then thank you so much and thank you for being such an engaged audience uh, and to our youngest member of the audience as well <laughs>